But can we level set in terms of the soul of America? Right now, hate crimes are on the rise. Random acts of gun violence. Women are under attack. Mr. President? I'll, I'll do one. The answer is yes, because that's why we can't let, well, uh, we cannot let this election be one where the same man who was president four years ago uh, becomes president again. Look, the What's vast the difference amount, between the two of you? Everything. 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 This is my video update from Larnica Cyprus on this Saturday, May 6th. Let's talk about some news and let's start things off with an update on what is going on with Gonzalo Lira, of which I really don't have anything more to add other than the, uh, the video that everyone I'm sure has seen of the SBU apprehending Gonzalo in what I imagine to be his, his apartment in Kharkov or where he was staying in, uh, in Kharkov. Now, there's a big difference between the first time the SBU got Gonzalo and this time around, and that is that the SBU, they have released video of Gonzalo's apprehension and a statement uh, connected to his apprehension along with what appears to be preparation for some sort of trial or uh, court slash criminal uh, procedure, proceeding. And the first time Gonzalo was uh, apprehended, there was none of that. There was no uh, video that was released by the SBU. There was no official statement, uh, nothing. It was, it was radio silence. Uh, Gonzalo went missing for like five, six days. And, uh, and then one day he contacted me and turned up and that was it. This time around, it is, uh, it is different. We've got photos and video and an official statement as well. And uh, the statement says that they are going to be holding Gonzalo in custody as an investigation plays out. And they do say in the statement that Gonzalo has, uh, has broken various criminal codes or alleged he has been alleged to have uh, broken various uh, criminal codes in, uh, in Ukrainian law. So I think that's a very, very big difference between the first time around and this time around. Now, the first time that Gonzalo was apprehended, uh, I did a video and, and I suggested that uh, people contact the, the Chilean embassy in Poland, which is the embassy that's responsible for Ukraine as well and contact the uh, Chilean Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And you may also want to try to contact the U.S. State Department and the American Embassy. I don't know if that's going to, to make any difference, but from what I understand, Gonzalo does have an American passport. I've never asked Gonzalo about what passports he holds, to be quite honest, but I think he does, he does have American citizenship. I'm not 100% sure on that. But uh, contacting the American embassy in Ukraine or the Department of State might, might help get Gonzalo uh, released or uh, deported out of Ukraine. But uh, last time it seemed like contacting the Chilean embassy and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for Chile, it seemed to have worked. The, the media pressure is something that the Alensky regime does not like. They don't like bad media. Uh, we've we've been reporting on the Duran and on this channel since the start of this conflict that if there's one thing that the Alensky regime is super sensitive to and super hyper focused on, it is the media. And so, keeping Gonzalo in the spotlight and and contacting the the embassy in Chile and just tweeting about it and posting about it. I think uh, will help because the Alensky regime is very sensitive about uh, bad media and the fact that they are holding um, a YouTuber, uh, an analyst, a blogger, a journalist, call, call Gonzalo whatever you like, an author. The fact that they're holding this, this person in custody is, 
is bad media for, for the Alensky regime, and I'm positive that they would not like that bad media. So um, that, that would be my suggestion. Outside of that, I really don't know what else we could do other than just keeping Gonzalo in the spotlight, uh, keeping attention on him, and, uh, and contacting the, the various embassies so they can apply pressure on the Alensky regime. But uh, I do want to I do want to stress that there seems to be a big difference between the first time he was apprehended and this time around. Um, it it is important to to be realistic about this and and just take note that this time around the SBU they have issued statements and videos and and um, appears. It appears to be going to some sort of court hearing, so that that is a big difference than uh, the first time he was taken into custody. Uh, the video itself was obviously um, produced and dramatized. It had music in the background. The uh, the soldiers, as they were entering the uh, the building where Gonzalo was staying, they fist bumped the the concierge when they entered the apartment. They they filmed uh, Putin books on the coffee table. Obviously, those were placed there by the SBU. I doubt Gonzalo has three or four books on Putin just sitting on his coffee table. They filmed his bathroom, I guess, to, to make a point that Gonzalo was, was living in, in some sort of squalor or something like that. They even, they even took like a video of, of like the window, the window uh, uh, sill right next to the the tripod and there was like broken pieces of of like the of plastic next to the window i guess once again to show that that gonzalo was not living in in uh, nice conditions i guess that's the purpose of filming filming all of that they also filmed his mobile phone lock screen which had a time of 9 32 a.m 2023 so we're to assume that they apprehended Gonzalo at 9.30 in the morning on uh, the 1st of, of May. And uh, it's, it's important to note that uh, they allowed Gonzalo, from what I saw in the video, they, they knocked on his door in the morning. He came out in his, in his pajamas and they allowed him to, I guess, uh, shower and change up. And uh, they took him into custody, but there were no handcuffs or anything like that. So that's also important to, to point out. They didn't cuff him or they, they didn't rough him up or anything like that. It seemed to be very, very uh, civil for the most part. And I think Gonzalo, as he was leaving the, the building, he actually gave uh, a peace sign to the, to the camera. Anyway, that is, uh, that's all I have to say on, uh, on this for now. And uh, let's, let's now move on. Let's move on to, to some news. And, and real quick, what, one more thing on, on Gonzalo is the timing of this. I'm not sure why they decided to arrest him now, but there must be something going on with the timing of this arrest because the Ukraine authorities, they knew where Gonzalo was staying all of this time since the first time they got him up until the other day they knew Gonzalo's location but for some reason they decided to uh, to grab him on the 1st of May my hunch and this is just a hunch would be that that uh, they decided to to uh, grab Gonzalo a week or two before the the counteroffensive got underway because they probably don't want someone in Ukraine uh, talking about the offensive from from a viewpoint that may not be favorable to the Ukraine military. That may be one of the reasons that they grabbed him now. Another reason may be to to uh, to spook, to shake up some of the the journalists and YouTubers and analysts who are going to be reporting on the uh, on the offensive. Maybe they want to shake them up a bit to people that are that are in this community or in this space. And so that's why they, they put out the video and dramatized everything. Maybe to, uh, 
to lower the morale of, uh, of people that are going to be reporting on everything that's about to happen in Ukraine. I don't know. These are just guesses on my end as to the timing of this of this uh, arrest, if you want to call it uh, an arrest. I guess it is an arrest. So let's uh, let's talk about the the offensive, the big spring, summer, winter, fall, spring offensive. It does look like this offensive is going to be taking place in the next week or two. So we can call this the May offensive. And I say it's going to happen because we got word from officials in Zaporozhye that uh, Russian officials in Zaporozhye that they are going to be evacuating the villages and towns in Zaporozhye and uh, they're going to be moving people relocating people to a safer location now keep in mind we're also talking about the ZNPP the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant as well in this area and so it does look like the Alensky regime and the Ukraine military will be launching their offensive, at least in the direction of the ZNPP and uh, the Zaporozhye area, which makes sense because the Alensky regime and the Ukraine military and the collective West, they have been wanting to, to get the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant now for, for a good year and a half. Uh, they've, they've really been trying hard to to take this uh, this power plant over, and so it makes sense that they would they would launch in they would launch an offensive in this direction. Now, I've got two things to say with this evacuation. Actually, two viewpoints with this evacuation, and these are just viewpoints. They're just two different ways that analysts are seeing this evacuation. So I'm just going to give you the two different ways. I'm not. I'm not saying that one of these two ways is what's going to actually happen or how things are going to unfold. I'm just going to tell you how various military analysts are uh, looking at this evacuation. Some, uh, some analysts are claiming that, that Russia has to evacuate these uh, villages because there's going to be intense fighting taking place. And the people that are living in these towns and villages, they need to be evacuated to to safer areas makes perfect sense and that Russia is going to to engage in very hard and very tough battles. So you have to uh, evacuate the people. That's the first way of looking at, uh, at this evacuation. There are other analysts who are saying that this evacuation could be, and I stress the word could, could be a signal that Russia is uh, is going to just uh, retreat from these areas because in the past when Russia has evacuated villages and towns eventually what has happened is that Russia has just retreated from areas and has created uh, a different defensive line a different defensive position and they've allowed Ukraine to take up territory uncontested we saw this in Kharkov we saw this in Kherson the Ukraine military, while they claim this was a victory, the Ukraine military really didn't fight any Russian soldiers. They just kind of took territory that the Russians just left behind. So there are analysts who believe that this could be, this could be an indication that Russia is about to, uh, to leave this territory and to just give it over to the Ukraine military and move back to to fall back to a different defensive line i'm not saying that's what's going to happen i'm just saying that these are two possibilities and i'm sure there's many more possibilities as to as to why russia has announced this evacuation of uh of citizens in of people in these towns and villages in zaporozhye i mean it makes perfect sense that you're going to want to move civilians out of these areas if you believe there's going to be intense fighting taking place absolutely i completely agree with that on the other hand i do see the point that some analysts are making in that when russia has has evacuated villages in the past it has eventually led to russia just ceding uh territory to the ukraine military 
and falling back to a different position. So that, that analysis also has uh, merit as well. So let's just wait and see. Let's just wait and see what happens. One thing I believe is, is a definite, and that is in the next couple of weeks, we will be getting the, the big offensive uh, starting up. That I think is, is pretty definite. Let's give it 99%. It looks like that is, that is going to be happening. But then again, who knows? Who knows? Maybe, maybe it doesn't happen. <laughs> maybe the offensive gets pushed back some more. I don't know. We're, we're just going to have to wait and see how this plays out. Lavrov, he was in uh, India, the Russian foreign minister, and he made some very interesting statements. He was at the uh, SCO meeting that was taking place, the Shanghai Cooperative meeting in Goa in India, and Lavrov said that... Uh, that the Russian Federation is absolutely ready to sit down and talk with the collective West and, and try to figure out a solution to this crisis. But Lavrov said that there's no reason to, to speak with Alensky because Alensky is a puppet. Those are the exact words that Lavrov used. He said Alensky is a puppet. Lavrov also talked about the terrorist attack on the Kremlin and he said and I quote it's clear that without the knowledge of their minders the terrorists from Kiev could not have carried out the attack Lavrov further said we will respond with concrete actions so another very high level government official of Russia is now on record saying that the terrorist attack against the Kremlin was uh, was carried out by Kiev but in back of Kiev you had the collective West the United States and the European Union so there was a TV interview that uh, took place the other day with Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Ryabkov and he said that Russia is really working very very hard to avoid escalation and a hot war with the United States and I quote we are working to keep relations with the US from falling into the abyss of an open armed conflict we are already on the verge, on the edge of this abyss, Ryabkov said on Thursday night in an interview with Russian Pervia TV channel. Russia and the U.S. maintain contacts, and the problem is in the lack of trust that Washington defies everything Moscow says as disinformation, he said. So you do get a sense that even after everything that has happened and all the escalation that has taken place the putin government does still cling on to the hope to the belief that they can uh that they can talk with the united states and with the collective west and to come to some sort of uh, of a solution to this crisis you do get that feeling that there still is that hope that someone in the collective West is going to snap out of this this madness and actually sit down and talk with the Russians and and come up with some sort of uh, of a peace plan. I don't see it. I personally don't see it, but I imagine that the officials of the Kremlin know a lot better than than I do. What I see coming from the collective West is is an absolute desire to keep this war going and for more escalation even if it means you have to destroy the collective west for them it seems like it's uh, it's worth it it's worth destroying their own countries if it means that they can destroy russia and i think there's no better example to this to this thirst this desire for the escalation of this conflict than jungle joseph burrell 
and Joseph Burrell, he was speaking at an EU conference uh, the other day, and he said that there is no other peace plan for what is going on in Ukraine other than Alensky's peace plan. And in this case, Burrell was referencing China's peace plan. Now, Lavrov in India, he said that the Chinese have not only presented a way out of the crisis in Ukraine, but they have presented a framework for uh, peace and security in Europe and, and in the world. And Lavrov said that Russia stands behind this Chinese effort. Well, Burrell, speaking at this EU conference or event or whatever it was, he said that the Chinese plan was, and I quote, not a peace plan. The only thing that can be called a peace plan is Alensky's proposal. The Chinese peace plan, well, it's not a peace plan. It's a set of wishful considerations, wishful thinking, but it's not a peace plan. If you want peace, push Russia to withdraw, Burrell added. Don't tell me to stop supporting Ukraine. Don't tell me, don't tell me stop supporting Ukraine. My opinion on Jungle Joseph is that he's he's gotten a real a real taste for for this escalation. He seems to really really be invested in uh, in this conflict and uh, he's he in no way wants this this conflict to end and if it were to end the only thing that would be acceptable to uh, to Jungle Joseph would be the complete defeat and uh, balkanization of the Russian Federation. That's, that's what I'm getting from uh, Joseph Burrell. Staying on the subject of China, we have news that NATO will be expanding to Japan in order to contain China. So NATO has announced that they will be opening up an office in Japan with the purpose of projecting power in Asia and, of course, containing China for an eventual smash with, uh, with the Chinese military. Now, I remember I did a video a long time ago, back when Liz Truss was Prime Minister of the UK, and the video was in Limassol. And I was talking about how Liz Truss, who had just become Prime Minister of the UK or was about to become Prime Minister of the UK, she, uh, she gave an interview and she said that NATO is going to absolutely expand to Asia. And sure enough, here we have the first NATO expansion into Asia with an office in Japan. Obviously, the Chinese are not happy about this. And they are once again warning NATO the United States, the EU, the Collective West, but is the Collective West going to, to listen to China's warnings? No freaking way. No way are they going to listen to the warnings that China is sending out. So um, let's do a couple of more stories and we'll wrap this video up. You know, uh, yesterday there was another shooting in Serbia a shooting that took place in a town outside of Belgrade. I believe that, I don't know the number of, of people that were killed. I want to say 10 people were, were shot in this latest shooting. So we had two days in a row, two consecutive days of shootings in uh, Serbia. Um, a, a horrific, uh, a horrific piece of news. And, um, you know, one shooting is, is, is a tragedy, but two shootings in a row is I just, I can't understand what's going on in, in Serbia. It's, it's pretty shocking, but our thoughts and prayers go out to, to all of the, the families that have, uh, that have lost someone in, in these two, these two tragedies that have taken place in Serbia. Uh, let's see, Yelensky held a meeting with BlackRock. That's interesting. The executives of BlackRock flew to Kiev to meet with Yelensky. Uh, the, the meeting that Yelensky had with the Czech Republic president, Mr. Pavel, 
was an interesting meeting because we have news that uh, Pavel presented Alensky with this, like an, uh, I believe in an, an antique pistol or something like that. And uh, that was an interesting piece of news. The Czech president handing Alensky a pistol, even if it is an antique pistol. An interesting development there. Alensky meeting with BlackRock. I wonder how that meeting went. Uh, he, he, hello, uh, executives from BlackRock. It's very, very good to, to have you here in, uh, in Kiev. Uh, be, before we start the meeting, let me just say that I know BlackRock has trillions of dollars in uh, assets. And, and you buy many, many properties and homes in the United States. So before we sit down to, to talk about all of the, the land and property I can give you in Ukraine, you tell me what, what money and what property you will give me in America. <laughs> I am sure that Alensky that left that meeting with a whole lot of homes, no doubt about it. But uh, BlackRock meeting in Kiev. We have news from CNN that the high Mars are useless. Well, they could be still they can still be used as a, as a system to launch uh, rockets to launch missiles. But the allure, the the advantage of the high Mars is now over because, according to CNN, the Russians are uh, jamming the the high Mars rocket systems, and so the wonder weapon is no longer. A wonder weapon the russian military they figured out the high mars actually i think they figured out the high mars a long time ago because it has been a good four four months since we've heard any any hype or praise about the high mars but now cnn is coming clean and they are reporting that the high mars are are uh, are high mars no more the russians have figured have figured them out and in in Germany, there's going to be celebrations for for May 9th, and the German officials, they said that they were not going to allow Russian and Ukrainian flags to be placed at memorials commemorating uh, World War II and May 9th victory, victory day, but the German officials have now walked back one of these uh, prohibitions and they have said that they will now allow the placing of the Ukrainian flag at memorials for May 9th but they will ban Russian flags isn't that something we had uh, in Houston let's go all the way to Houston we had a fire at a refinery break out in Houston a huge fire from what I understand that uh, broke out in Houston and there were victims and I've seen the video footage of this fire it was it was massive at this refinery in Houston and finally let's uh, do some clown worlds Biden and Kamala they tweeted out a photo on social media and uh, this appeared on President Biden's official Twitter account and it said get in folks we're going to lunch with Biden and Kamala sitting in presidential limousine and I like this tweet from Zlatdi 71 who has this this tweet from Biden get in folks we're going to lunch and then Zlatdi 71 says I have lost my appetite suddenly <laughs> well well said well said and we have the coronation of Prince Charles which is going to be taking place soon and we do have confirmation that Alensky's wife will be in London to attend the coronation ceremony of Britain's monarch, Charles III. And the Ukraine Ministry of Defense, they put out this image of King Charles holding an F-16, a fighter jet, saying, God save the king, as they beg for F-16s from the Collective West, which I imagine they will eventually get. So that is the video, everybody. That is the cloud world. It is super windy here on the beach in Larnica, Cyprus. Opa, vduran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, 
check us out on Rumble, please. And we are on Odyssey, Bitch Shoot, and Telegram. And go to the Duran shop. Use the code. Good day. 10% off. Take care. God save the king! God save the king!